Look, I, I, we do have a surprise uh, for, for everyone. And, and actually, we have an even bigger surprise for our dear friend, Craig. And uh, I'm, I'm going to ambush him with something absolutely spectacular. Upon the breakout, gold's going to make a new all-time high. Gold-backed ETFs in inflows of over $5 billion. $8 trillion gold market. Why are we the only guys to see on this Make your head spin. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Shane Moran here. I'll be your host for this episode of Live from the Vault. And do we have a treat for you today on so many levels. Uh, what I would do right now is make sure you get this information out to everyone you know. As you can imagine, the Kinesis Global community is growing very fast. This is our 40th episode. And like I said, we have a treat for you today. Fasten your seatbelt. Keep spreading the word about this channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Click on that bell notification if you'd like to be notified as these episodes go live. And uh, we've had such a, a ride. Now, why is it that we're growing so fast? I think it's because, and I think you know it's because, that this is the place that you can get information that you just can't get anywhere else. We're exposing the underbelly of the precious metals market, bringing the light to the true price of gold and silver. And due to this, uh, you know, we're, we know this is why we're growing so fast. And uh, we thank you and our whole community. Like I said, we have a treat. Not only do we have an amazing special returning guest, Mr. Craig Hemke from the TF Metals Report, but we have a surprise for you in store today. I won't delay because we've got lots to cover, but... Um, Look, uh, over to Andy McGuire at Talking Gold, but I, maybe we should change it to Talking Silver, Andy. In the last little while, we've been getting a lot of... Actually, the majority of the questions have not been about gold. It's been about silver. So let's join uh, Andy over to you, Talking Gold, and let's start off with silver because that's the topic that we've been hearing about uh, for a long time now. Over to you, Andy. Great to be with you again, Shane. Always love to hear from you, my silver friend. Um, look, I, I, we do have a surprise uh, for, for everyone. And, and actually, we have an even bigger surprise for our dear friend, Craig. And uh, I'm, I'm going to ambush him with something absolutely spectacular. And he's going to love it. You're going to love it. And uh, anyway, this is a surprise to him as well. Um, now, look, the, yes, Shane. Yes, indeed, there has been a so many questions of the questions that we get. They are about silver. And, and so let's take a quick look before Craig comes on. And we're going to look at um, the silver market from a wholesale market perspective, which is one of the values we can add. And why even a small amount of physical silver taken out of the legacy market at the margin gets far more traction than most people realize. Now, look, obviously, we know gold is tight for, uh, for size and, and, and it's running at a healthy premium. I mean, that, that's a fact. If any wholesaler will tell you, you can get it, but there's a premium attached to it. And, and so, but the, the larger the size you, you need, the more the premium is. So, so really then let's look at the much smaller silver market, which is exactly the same actors but it's under stress for supply at the key is current prices. Now, although it's pretty clear as we record this episode, it's ahead of FOMC tonight, uh, quad witching on Friday, um, it's patently clear that silver has been contained into each breach of the 28s, the $28 level. But this is largely short-term options related driven paper market action and it's once again coiling silver to a, into a very similar degree that we evidenced into April the 15th, just ahead of its breaking out of a similarly contained level at 26. So, look, silver is, from a health wholesale market perspective, silver is very, very interesting below 28. So I would like to spend just a little time looking at silver and what is really driving the physically underpinned higher stair steps, which I really do largely attribute to the Wall Street silver movement, actually. Now, mainstream media, and yes, even the likes of Jeff Curry and Jeff Christian, have pretty much stopped scoffing 
at the power of this movement. Have you noticed the absence? And, and, it, and, and that is the point. This is a movement, and it's severely impacting the at-the-margin paper to silver supply. And, and obviously, we know that, that that huge imbalance of paper to silver has been the, the, the actual mechanism to contain the silver price. Yeah, look, the, the, really, there are hundreds of tons of paper silver cleared each day in London. But let's look at how the massive leverage that has historically enabled these paper markets to uh, to, to be enabled the, these these positions to be netted out amongst the silver cartel, and it is a cartel, um, and how at the margin this is turned against them in the legacy market. So let's start by putting some facts to figures. And I think that's the key thing here that, that is missing. In a recent interview with Wall Street Silver, I drew attention to Silver's 500 to one paper to physical leverage and how every two ounces of real physical move from the market, removed from the market, actually ultimately forces the unwind of one full 1000 ounce wholesale silver bar. Try lifting one of those. And as many people know, that is a that is a wholesale. That is how we measure the wholesale market. And it's the wholesale market that is actually the key focus here, because that is what's at the margin. Yes, we see the the um, we see silver rounds, big premiums, one thing, or another. We see shortages. We see mints running out. But it's the sil it's the wholesale silver market that is the key issue here. Now, the scale of the Wall Street silver retail short squeeze efforts have been grossly underestimated. And the usual house price capping tactics of hunting margin paper market, hot money, long stops to keep the silver price contained. In other words, you know, people who borrow money inside the casino, either Comex, they borrow money from 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 the house and then wonder why uh, they've suddenly lost all their money. Um, so. This is how, how the game's been played. So they literally know what the pain level is and they come after you and take it out. And it's increasingly, but this, is, this game is increasingly being offset by an army of unmargined physical buyers doing the exact opposite, buying the dip, not getting rinsed out by a dip. And the first thing to do is to justify this 500 to one leverage which means there's 500 ounces of silver traded for every ounce left in the vault. And I'm going to talk, Craig's going to run through uh, something interesting about gold and the 100 to 1 leverage in gold in a little while. But look, what this is an unprecedented, what, what this is, is given the unprecedented fresh wholesale physical demand is discernibly eating up annual mine supply, it's going to force wholesale silver capped inside the, the ETFs uh, to rise in price. And we'll look at ETFs perhaps later with, with, with Craig and, and how these ETFs are actually used to contain the price of silver. Now, 500 to 1, though, is not a number that's been picked out of thin air. In fact, it's actually this number is easy to discern. Now, the LPMCL is on record as currently clearing around 9,350 tons, tons of unallocated silver credit on a net daily basis per day. Now, to put that into perspective, that's more than a third of annual mined silver transacted in a single day. But if we look at the LBMA's physical transactions recorded at the daily silver fixes, Physical volumes are actually a fraction of that. Now, for example, the T plus two delivery volumes, i.e. you buy it at the fix and you, you demand delivery in two days. Uh, the, the T plus two delivery volumes usually average around 20 tonnes. And we just remember, we're talking about 9,300 odd tonnes of paper, 20 tonnes of, of physical being delivered on an average day, which equates to a paper silver ratio of 450 to one. So it's pretty close. Now, today, on Wednesday, today's Wednesday, and actually we saw just, we saw 24.8 tonnes offered, offered at 27, 
uh, $27.71. $27 However, this 450 to 1 does not include all derivatives. So I think the 500 to 1 actually ratio looks conservative. But incidentally, these, this 500 paper to physical bapping was actually touted by CPM's group Jeffrey Christian back in 2014 when he was challenged and he was defensively justifying the 100 to 1 gold statement he had made at the CFTC meeting in, uh, in March, uh, March uh, 2010 which I think was a, a, a big mistake of him. Now, look, Silver's joined at the hip to gold. So unless in the impossible scenario, insiders drive the gold silver ratio to hundreds to one, i.e. takes hundreds of dollars of hundreds of ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold, that's not gonna happen. These same actors, are busy unwinding are like th that are busy unwinding allocated unallocated gold into Basel three requirements and we have studied this in detail over the last year. They're going to have to do the same in silver. Now, at five hundred to one, every single two ounces, every two ounces physically delivered out of the legacy market is the equivalent to the removal of a thousand ounce wholesale bar. So anyone who doubts the effectiveness of the silver squeeze and bets against it is going to be seriously wrong footed. Now leverage, as we know, it works both ways. Borrowing silver credit at 450 to one, and that's being generous, to short sell it into a well bid T plus two spot delivery market is becoming far too risky. And the footprints prove it. Now price suppression would require a coordinated effort. However, we see the bullion banks accumulating physical silver as increasingly in competition with each other, scrambling to source silver as far and wide as they can. And as an example that we've previously reported on this months ago, um, that we ran into uh, Standard Chartered in, in, in a refinery that we were dealing with in Russia. And I mean, you know, they were coming in, why? They were coming in to source try and find some silver. And the, it, look, basically, we know, we know that it, it, look, if this ex as an example, um, this bank here is a COMEX uh, registered bank. And if they are absorbing large refinery premiums, as well as expensive transportation costs from Russian refineries to the US, you have to ask the question, why? because they and every other bullion bank see silver as grossly undervalued at this price that you see on a chart today. So look, there are well over 100,000 members and growing of Wall Street Silver. Now, comp look, they're, they're competing for their share of physical silver ounces. That's ounces, kilos, and yeah, tons. And this is at the margin demand has spilled out into the institutional wholesale market space. And as we've evidenced since April the 15th, from a much higher stair step in this past two weeks into multiple opportunities, historical opportunities that would have normally been jumped on to pull the bid pull, rig Comex silver layer, this T plus two delivery market has forced insiders to cover Collusive COMEX paper bid pulling efforts way, way earlier than, than they had originally planned, uh, these algos had originally planned. So, so as far as silver is concerned, attempts to shake off the silver short squeeze has simply not worked. In fact, this most recent attempt that we saw into non-farm payrolls and CPI last week, and this week as we move into FOMC, and quad witching events on Friday, any of these moves are so blatantly counterintuitive to the strong physical market fundamentals. So as a result, it's tipping the physical supply demand balance with these capping efforts being recognized as a discount buying opportunity, which in turn has simply driven in much more insider physical demand to compete with this. Look, silver below 28 is seen by multiple physical buyers as an unnatural paper to physical imbalance, which should be exploited before the physical market drives silver higher into the next stair step supports, it supports into the 30s. And this is an interim step. Look, the 500 to one platform 
has uh, the 500 to 1 uh, situation has accrued because just like gold at 100 to 1, we'll get crazy to talk about that in a minute, unallocated gold and silver credit is categorized as physical. There's no differentiation. So this 9,300 tons that gets cleared of silver every day in London is no different. It's not categorized any differently to a real ounce of silver. This is crazy. And, and so this, this meant that the historically, uh, paper, this historically driven paper, gold and silver, these over-the-counter positions, you could take an over-the-counter position, which is constitute this 9,300 tons, and you could hedge it with a non-delivery cash settled COMEX futures position. You could do it ad infinitum, or at least until the you'd reach this sort of gold 100 to 1 or 500 to 1 in silver, when you reach this ratio of paper to physical limits, you knew you'd pretty much maxed out at that level. But those ratios are now unraveling. And that is where I really want to start to bring in and invite Craig to join us. This subject of unallocated and leveraged metal has come up countless times. The best way that I can explain it so that people understand what I'm talking about is this. You know, you, you own metal in, in uh, Perth or Montreal or Zurich or whatever, and you do so in an unallocated form because, you know, you don't want to take delivery. You know, there's some risk of having it stored in your vault, you know, and then you, gotta, you feel like you got to insure it. And if you have some other company store it for you, uh, then you got to pay them to store it. And a, yeah, that's a negative carry cost and all these things. And so you think, OK, look, I, I'll do this unallocated thing because the company tells me I can always get my hands on it whenever I want it. And, uh, I, and their fees are greatly reduced. Great. Perfect. I'll do it. What you don't understand is that means you don't actually own it. And if you show up demanding it, they're going to say, OK, sign here and we'll get it to you in 60 or 90 days. Well, what if you don't want to play that game? And think about it to its logical conclusion. Here's the story I always use. <clears throat> say you live in New York City or London or some other, you know, real densely populated, high cost of living place. And you own a car because you like having a car. You know, there's times you want to get out of town. Go out to the Hamptons, you know, if you're a wealthy J.P. Morgan trader. Or maybe it's just your insurance policy because, you know, in some Mad Max world like we had last year, you need to get the heck out of Dodge. But the problem is, if you ever try to insure a car, living in London, New York City, it's expensive as heck. Then you got to park it, right? That's a solid couple of hundred bucks a month, if at least, to park it. So you don't want a whole car. You just would rather have the right to have a car when you want it. So the car garage, recognizing this is a pretty good deal, buys a car and they sell that car to 50 different people, or at least the privilege of taking it out for a spin to 50, 100 different people in New York City. All of those 100 people think they own a car. They think whenever they need it in an emergency, they can go down to the garage and pick it up, right? But they don't own a car. They all own the same car. And this is fine. As long as only one person in 100 shows up at a time, the garage says, yeah, here's the car. May not be the original VIN number from the car you dropped off, but here's a car. Yeah, take it out for a spin. As long as only one person shows up at the same time, then that scheme continues and the garage makes a bunch of money because they're storing an imaginary car. <laughs> Where it all blows up is when word gets out, there's really only one car. And one somebody shows up and they're told, well, I know there's an emergency going on. It's Mad Max here in New York City and you got to get out of Dodge, but sign this paper and we'll get you a car within 60 days. What? Wait a second. <laughs> it says right here, I own a car. No, sorry. It also says in the fine print, we can get you a car in 60, 90 days if you ever need one. Well, then word starts to spread, right? And everybody else that thinks they own the car, they all show up at the garage wanting that car. Well, now, the only person that's getting the car is the first person that showed up and demanded it. It ain't coming back. The other 99 people are out of luck, right? The garage operators hightail it out of town. Doors are locked. That's what an unallocated account is. That's beautiful. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah, oh, the, the, whoever that guy is, man, he's, that's a brilliant uh, analogy, I guess. Now, you guys, that's uh, the, the clips are <laughs> tremendous. What a great job you guys did. 
this is the best single explanation I've ever, ever seen. And, and I, I see it as going viral. And as you say, kudos to the Live from the Vault team for putting this together. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I, I, Andy, I don't even know how to program a VCR, and there are not even VCRs <laughs> left in the world. I could never have done anything like that. Hey, hey, Craig, I think you've done a service to the whole world here because you've uh, taken a very complicated topic of unallocated. We talk about it all the time, unallocated versus physical and so on, but this is just brilliant the way you've described it. Uh, everyone, even if they've never bought a piece of uh, silver or gold, even if they don't know what it is, they'll un understand this for sure. So thank you so much. Uh, Shane, I, hey, I appreciate that very much. It, uh, yeah, that, that was, that's just great fun. I mean, Andy, you, know, you and I know we've used that analogy. I, I don't even know how many times. Uh, and uh, to see it <laughs> produced like that, yeah, it was just great. You guys did great work. I, yeah, that, that, thing all, that thing ought to spread far and wide, I would hope. Well, you know, in, in fact, as you say that, th th this is just the start because – I was talking to the director of a very soon to be released primetime Hollywood documentary about Wall Street corruption. Um, and that it covers everything. Gold's just a part of that story. And so yeah. it's talking about illegal mm -hmm. naked shorting. I mean, how com companies and countries get put out of business by this illegal act. And, and this is going to be completed probably in the next, finished in the next week. Uh, I think they were just looking to try and interview Ron Paul to f close it up. And then and then it's going to be released in a matter of weeks. Now, I, look, I assisted with the gold and silver section and I sent this to him a couple of days ago. And it's so good an explanation. It, it, I'm absolutely I mean, it'd be a mind blown if this wasn't included. So, my dear friend, you are a Hollywood star. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? With that, oh my gosh, that would be uh, that would be quite a hoot, uh, Andy. And I, man, for all the effort you put in over the years, to think that we might actually <laughs> live to see this happen. I know we've we've joked over the last decade, you know, they're like, geez, when will this ever, you know, come apart at the seams? I mean, the the fraud and the corruption is so obvious to everybody that's willing to look, but as so many people have an interest in keeping it going. And, uh, and so to finally get somewhere, I mean, I don't know if you've been following along some of the stuff Rob Kainz, Kainz has been doing yep. Uh, yep. at his site with a guy by the name of Dan, uh, what's yeah. Dan, Vigario. Yeah. Um, that's been fun too. I, I, I remember I, I got an email from Dan about, I don't know, like a month ago. And he said, man, I, there's some fishy stuff here. Um, he goes, can you put me in touch? He wanted to get out to John Adams and and I, and I said, sure. And I think John kind of sent him over to Rob. And then Rob has an auditor background. And Dan is a chartered accountant. And for what they've been able to do in um, uh, kind of forensically deconstructing the public documents of the Perth Mint to show what's actually going on there. And again, it goes along with you know what, what we put together, what you guys put together with that um, unallocated scheme and how it runs. Look, the, the veil is getting pulled back, and it, it's been really fun to watch this year, and it leaves you really wondering where this might all be headed. I mean, you and I have talked about the, the NSFR stuff of Basel III coming, and yep. uh, it just, it's an exciting time to be alive, my friend. And I think what, what you just referred to, I think what that instance of this forensic accounting and the Perth Mint, that wouldn't have even come to light had it not been for the immense amount of work uh, that, for example, this Wall Street silver movement has yep. started a squeeze that is creating situations like this, which they never envisaged. And to be caught yeah. with your pants down by a forensic accountant it, on, on a, on a this, this is, Perth Mint is insured by the Western Australian government. I mean, good God, there must be a hell of a lot of questions going around here. And, you know, but, I also wondered, because you've done a lot of work, and, 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 and I think one of the things I was going to ask you about as well, as part of this Wall Street silver movement to squeeze the silver market and to draw attention to the anniversary of the notorious May the 1st, Comex driven, $6, 30 grand a contract, rents, price-ringing rents. Last month, you joined forces with Wall Street Silver 
and a lot of friends. Uh, and you were calling, if I remember, it was 100,000 silver stackers all by 100 ounces. Uh, OK, well, we know not everyone could afford to buy that much, but it aggregated together tens of thousands right. of Wall Street Street members, Reddit members, all these people, part, all this movement, all concatenating at the same time to secure physical delivery, to make a statement on May the 1st anniversary, it caught the attention of several fund managers that I personally know to jump in on this momentum. And, and as we know, um, obviously we, you said May the 1st, but of course the Monday was May the 3rd, uh, which was the Monday anniversary uh, and if you remember, silver opened up at 25,990 on that day. And I honestly, Craig, I don't think it was a coincidence that into the 15th of May, a few days later, silver rose three bucks, topping out at 28,9 temporarily. But dis and despite the foot stamping efforts, which would normally, we yeah. know what would have happened, we'd have seen a huge rinse. What support came in at 27. Now, the reason. I draw attention to this is it shows how tight at the margin silver is and how yeah. little real physical demand uh, exiting the smoke and mirrors world of the LBMA silver market that clears well over 9,000 tons of silver a day. At the margin, it makes a difference. So what's your thoughts on, on where we are with this, mate? Well, we got to keep pedal to the metal. Uh, the Wall Street silver crowd is now over 100,000 people in that uh, Reddit forum, I guess, uh, that have subscribed to it. And we really, I mean, really, really do have to keep going. We, and we have a number of things kind of working in our favor um, that are kind of, I guess, coincident. One of them is this thing with the U.S. Mint. You know, they are, for the first time in whatever it is, 12 years, something like that, they've redesigned the American Silver Eagle. And in doing so, uh, they stopped production of them. And so that has, that has driven premiums on American Eagles through the roof. I mean, I've seen them as high as 10 and $12 because there just aren't any. And then here's the thing. Once they start rolling those out next month, you've got not only a catch-up of, of demand of people that, you know, that's probably the most popular silver coin in the world. You've got collectors, you know, people that want the first series, you know, the beautiful, uh, the, the uncirculated ones, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so there's not going to be an abundance of demand for eagles and i and i heard this directly um uh, from ken lewis at atmex which is the largest online bullion dealer he said we're not going to have an abundance of supply of eagles until sometime next year wow. so that premium on eagles is going and then you know that's going to stay high and so that's going to drive demand for britannia's and uh and mm -hmm. uh, maple leafs you know and everything else from around the world and that premium is going to stay almost you know astronomically high and at some point price is going to have to rise. The paper price is going to have to rise to somewhere near that level because it's a bifurcated market. And if you bifurcate the paper and the, and the physical price, it makes the whole thing, you know, to any uh, objective observer appear to be, you know, uh, some, what, what, a scam somehow. What, what, what's going on here? How come the price on Bloomberg's 27, but I can't buy it for less than 37 or 39? So what, what's the real price? And the banks, as you mentioned, are fighting really hard. My God, Andy, have you looked at that daily chart over the last month? I mean, it is the tightest uh, little one dollar range between twenty seven fifty and twenty eight fifty. Uh, yes. They're doing everything they can to keep it in line. The, the key levels I've been watching, we've just barely started to cross twenty eight on a weekly basis. That's the first time we didn't even do that last summer. We're yep. getting there, and uh, twenty eight fifty on a daily basis will be critical. And, and they, why do I say that? Because that kind of opens the door to 30. Mm. And once, once we start trading silver with a three on it, even this Comex pretend plastic banana silver, uh, that's going to get a lot of attention. And, I, and I'll, I'll draw you back to a year ago at this time, Andy, because I know, uh, you know we talk all the time, we watch all this stuff. Exactly a year ago, in June of last year, uh, gold had bottomed below about 1671 after the June jobs report. And then it began moving higher. It had been in a range between 1680 and 1780 for about 100 days. It began to move higher, moved out above 1780 mm -hmm. in late June, and then started to rally into July as well, into the, into the 1800s. And the whole time, silver was doing nothing. 
And I, I know it was driving you crazy, it was driving me crazy, driving people at, at, at TF Metals Report crazy because we're like, what is the deal here? Gold's rallying, you know, all this money printing and silver is stuck between 17 and a half and 19 and going nowhere. And then finally, by about the middle of July, all of a sudden silver got above 19 and the day it started trading with a two in front of it, oh man, it went from 20 to 29, 30 in like 17 days. I mean, that's yeah. just kind of how it works. So we'll watch silver pretty diligently here over in the weeks ahead because uh, once it, you know, they're working really hard to keep it from attaining that three. But man, once that three is on there, it's going to go up pretty fast and that's going to ripple through everything uh, and have a big impact. Yeah, in fact, um, and, and really talk to a lot of liquidity providers and, and uh, that we talk to every day and the, some of the big desks. In fact, you're right. The minute that 30 handle because that'll become support. Then really, if you go back and look at 2012, there's a gap to close yeah. to 35, 250 or whatever it is, 35, two something. And that's a gap close. And that, it, you know, gaps always get closed. And that will be, and once we start to get, as you say, once you get into the mid thirties, then really the, the, we start to see sideline money, as you say, look, when you when you cap you cap you cap yeah what are you doing is you're, you're trying to remove the interest you're trying to you know say look we've got no momentum here you know you there's loads of silver and we'll talk about that in a minute <laughs> yeah, lots of silver yeah yeah we miscounted it by the way but yeah um <laughs> as we know but but really it is it's about momentum unfortunately yeah. that's the way it is yeah but that's but, it, but the inverse of that, which is what the beautiful thing about the Wall Street silver movement is, hey, you know, you discount it for me, baby. I come in, I'll buy it. Thank right. you so much. Right. And it's not even the PSYOPs operation right. doesn't work. Only works if you've borrowed money from the casino. Well, they know exactly where, where you borrowed it, what your margin is, and they'll come and take it from right. you. I mean, hey, a casino, what is it? 5% win, 95% lose. I mean, that's the structure of the COMEX. So... You know, it's, it's, this is, this is I, I hear what you're saying about the 30s. But look, Craig, you've done a lot of work um, uh, drawing attention to the implausible inflows and outflows as well of the gold and silver ETF sets. We're talking about GLD and, and SLV and then being very careful because, because that, those, are, those are the ones we're actually talking about here. And, but I think... <clears throat> Since 1995, and I know you've drawn attention to this in the past, and I think a lot of people just don't get this, there was the ability to take an exchange for physical COMEX position, and you could move this position, uh, COMEX position, into GLD mm -hmm. and SLV, into the ETFs. Now you could exchange one for the other. Hey, hang on a minute. These are undeliverable contracts. And, and I think this has enabled the ETF price of gold and silver to be contained, and which obviously provides the necessary flywheel to use warrants to settle these inflows and outflows while buying time to swamp real physical demand with this freshly created unbacked gold and silver. So, but here's my question, without so many, with so many alternative physical investment vehicles now that are unable to be naked shorted and are 100% physically backed, do you see this game getting tapped out? Well, it makes you wonder, Andy. You know, I know you've been spending a lot of time uh, talking on these Basel III changes that are coming that are going to impact the EU banks on June 28th. And you know, there was that statement we found uh, from the U.S. Comptroller of the or the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, <laughs> basically stating the same thing for uh, U.S. banks as of July the first uh, that they have to come in. You know, basically at the end of the day, it makes unallocated metals positions almost untenable. Um, and, I've, and I've been watching, at least on some of the CFTC reports, if you can trust them, it looks like the U.S. banks are uh, kind of trying to get out of some of their unallocated or just naked positions. And you wonder how that'll ripple through. You know, I, I, I've wondered, this has been such a weird month, Andy, uh, so far, uh, in that you've got all the, what appears to be paper-driven smashes in gold. You know, where the COMEX just gets drilled. And of course, that brings, you know, that's the old futures tail wagging the spot dog. You, you jam the futures price lower, the spot price drops, 
<clears throat> and then very likely those same banks that are driving the futures price lower are able to step in and get out from under and, and uh, cover some short positions in, in uh, unallocated and allocated spot. And, they're, and they keep playing yes. this game. And so I wonder if uh, how much that's impacting things this month. And then you've also got this this nonsense of the Fed saying every you know inflation oh, it's just transitory, it's transitory, it's transitory, it's transitory. Don't worry about it, it's transitory. And everybody now that's like the key word that everybody. Every, well, mantra. I have it in my it's head nuts. Now. Yeah. Um, and I and so there's I think a coming realization um, that yeah we may not clip along at eight percent CPI, but uh, we're not going back to two either. And so I, I think as we get deeper into the summer here, there's going to be more about, you know, we're going to remove some of this goofiness that's happening in June and all the uncertainty around how these the Basel III impacts are going to hit those unallocated accounts. And then also we get, I guess, a little more certainty about, you know, the Fed's been kind of pulling our leg a little bit here and they're not, they're not tapering, they're not raising rates. And inflation is not just simply something that's going back to 2%. And I think we start catching a a pretty solid bid. Back to your ETFs. Um, yeah, man, I, Andy, you have done, I remember you and I talking about it 10 years ago and you, you described it as a flywheel for, you know, the, the only parties that can withdraw metal from the GLD and the SLV or it, really any of those kind of phony baloney ETFs, you know, where really all you get is exposure. The only parties that can take metal out are the, what are called authorized participant banks. And who are they? The bullion banks. And so, you, I mean, you can almost always notice that whenever they get a little short on physical metal, somehow uh, the price declines and then the ETF gets hit with, you know, 10 tons of withdrawals. <laughs> well, I wonder where that went. You know, and, and you know, so, many, so much work has been done about how much metal there, are, there actually is in London. You know, the LBMA tries to say it's 8,000 metric tons or whatever. Uh, counting all of the Bank of England's gold and all this ETF gold as if that's all just freely available on a daily basis, you know? So I, I'm, I'm with you, man. I, uh, we've got to just keep stacking physical metal that a lot of folks at the Wall Street Silver site use the, uh, the PSLV. And actually, you can use the PHYS as well, which is a Sprott Physical Gold. Um, those are physically... Uh, backed ETFs and they take physical delivery. I just saw a great interview with Rick Rule about, I don't know, a week ago where he described how difficult it's been for them to actually source the metal and then ship it to Toronto. They've had to actually set up some sub custodian agreements in different places around the world so they can get their hands on, on the thousand ounce bars that they got to have at the wholesale level uh, by prospectus. And so we're, we're really having uh, a def definite impact and how that goes. And Andy, one last thing, and I'll shut up, but I wanted to get back to this. Um, when we mentioned the Perth Mint and that work that Rob and Dan are doing, mm. a lot of their numbers are coming off of the annual report of the Perth Mint, right? And because, you know, that's all they can use are these public documents. The next annual report is due here, I don't know, within the next month. A key thing that happened uh, late last year, maybe it was early this year, was Perth Mint sold their what was alleged to be a physically backed ETF, they sold it to Goldman Sachs. And Goldman yes, Sachs did. bought it and immediately changed all the terms and said, ah, no, 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 no more of this physical delivery stuff, man. And they switched it around to where just like GLD and everything else, only the banks and mainly Goldman can take physical metal out of it. So I'll be very interested to see how that's accounted in the next set of Perth Mint, uh, you know, financial statements that'll come with this next annual report. Um, how does that piece fit? And why did they sell it? You know, all that. So anyway, there's yeah. so much phony baloney stuff that goes on in these markets. And it's, it's all, you know, it's all alchemy. It's all designed to create the illusion that there's more physical metal than there really is. If you can get people to believe that some kind of synthetic Make believe ETF share on allocated account is just as good as the real thing. Then it might as well be the real thing. And you know that's that's one of the things that that I think is so good about this is that 
you know, obviously from an institutional perspective, from a, from a wholesale market perspective, look, we're getting this. It drew the attention. This has drawn the attention to the likes of Perth Mint. But also we're talking about the ETFs. We're talking about uh, SLV. We're talking about GLD. It's drawn attention to the fact. And this is where we now see, see fund managers saying, well, hey, what are the alternatives? And obviously you've named a couple. Uh, we've got, uh, obviously in Switzerland, there's a lot of physically backed ETFs as well. Uh, we're getting a lot of volume through, uh, mm -hmm. through our Kinesis product, which is physical metal. So basically there are alternatives. And I think that is, this is where that flywheel that we talked about yeah. is getting depleted. And, you know, this ability to swap stuff around between the COMEX and the, these ETFs was the key mechanism. And it's absolutely right. being disconnected. And I think it's what amazes me, though, Craig, is it's at the margin. It takes so right. little physical because of this massive leverage right. working two ways. You start taking two ounces of 500 to one silver out. You've just taken a wholesale bar right. out of, of the system. And it's like that's what this whole right. thing is built on. Um, yes, we talk about uh, premiums on, on silver rounds and 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 it's a good thing because um, there are a lot of business people around there who go, well, you know what, maybe I was never interested in gold and silver before, but hold on a minute. What about this arbitrage opportunity? Maybe I should go and smelt some thousand yeah. ounce bars and create some rounds. And it's like, yeah, it won't be a silver eagle, but it could be something else. And, and it's going to be so really what you're doing is in reverse forcing more and more and more institutional money into uh, to buy take this the uh, competing you you talked about sprout having trouble getting a thousand ounce bars to to the degree you want them uh, we have to source all over the world to get um allocated uh, to get some right. allocations to fill all these wonderful silver but there will come a point and this is what really annoys me is that when you get a statement and i think we've got this statement it's <laughs> from the slv at the, it's possible that authorized participants may be unable to acquire <laughs> sufficient silver that is an acceptable delivery for the trust for the issuance of new baskets due to a limited then available supply, blah, blah, blah. Right. You know where that's going from. Well, hold on a minute. What's the first question that runs into your mind? If an authorized participant see, has orders coming in, why the right. hell don't they go to market and buy it? Right. A simple question. Right. I mean, it's supply demand. You got three thousand tons right. coming in for de for delivery. You have to go out and buy three thousand right. tons of silver. And no, there's no discussion. So, in other words, what do you what do you think they're doing here? It yeah, has to be absolutely. a naked short. What do you but, think? Again, that's how it all works. And where where it can really have an impact is, I mean, this market works off a of flow. It doesn't go work off a of stock. And these banks have to flow metal around the planet yep. to somehow settle it out at this phony baloney price that they that they discover through the trading of the derivatives. And it's the math is not very complicated. I mean, every everybody, I mean, it's all public knowledge. What, 850 million ounces, maybe 880 million ounces a year comes out of the ground. Uh, most of it from, you know, Mexico, Peru, mm -hmm. another couple of of uh, countries. But it's a pretty consistent number. Well, here's the problem, you know, uh, the, the global, especially for green tech uh, demand is pretty stable, if not growing from I don't know, 550 million to 600 million ounces a year. So that leaves, let's call it 300 million ounces for investment demand. Well, what happens when you chew all that up? You've got a supply deficit. So then you've got to find other sources because you can't run that for very long. And then, you you know, you get these shills and apologists and people that have a uh, vested interest because of the, their, their corporate sponsors and keeping the price down and they come rolling out and they'll say, oh, no worries. You know, there's actually 5 billion ounces of silver around on the planet because they're counting grandma's candlesticks and, you know, and, and a tea set as part of the available silver. Well, I can tell you at $28 an ounce, grandma's candlesticks are not available for sale. Okay. There's a price where maybe somebody's, you know, going to roll out, you know, and try yes. to drop those off, but it ain't 28. 
And as you and I know, I mean, the, the curious thing about silver, and really, I, this is maybe I am not just a silver thing. This is across all markets here in the West. People don't want it when it's down. People only want stuff that goes up. You know, look at the stock market. I mean, it's driven by 10 yep. stocks. Nobody wants all the other ones. They just want the momentum plays, the ones that are going up. So when silver, you know, is down and languishing, nobody wants it. But when it starts to rally, oh, crap, all of a sudden, you know, it's demand for everywhere. And this gets back to why the banks have worked so hard, particularly just in the last month, to keep it in check. Because, again, once that price starts printing with a three in front, man, that's going to get everybody's attention. And then it's going to go up 33 and to that gap you're talking about up there about 35 or six. And again, on some basic fundamental factors that are being distorted and have been distorted for years by this ridiculous scheme, this paper derivative pricing scheme that the that the banks run. And and it's been attacked. And and I think that's the beauty of it. It's been done in in such a such a good way because you're just talking about it's it's because it's at the margin and because of the leverage. Th these fools have created a situation which is imploding yeah. on them. This is we're gonna look in the rear view mirror at this and people are gonna say, you remember when people I mean there were people a long time ago that said you know this bitcoin thing oh it's only a buck you know should i shouldn't i get some hey guys look at silver 27 28 bucks this rear view mirror stuff wait yeah. till it's 200 wait till it's 100 yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. the point is or 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 andy in in a real day a real present day example um, the, the all of those metals markets are basically run the same, especially the, when you get into this kind of precious, pseudo precious, you know, white metal kind of stuff. And so gold, silver, platinum and palladium are all kind of run the same, or at least they always have been, uh, where you've got, you know, this kind of spot physical market in London, but you got the paper market in New York and uh, palladium had been held in check for years, just like the rest of them. But the problem was once we kind of got into this new Cold War mm -hmm. uh, back in the, you know, the latter part of the last decade, all of a sudden Russia, who produces about 40 percent of the world's palladium supply, you know, they, they're still being sanctioned, right, because of the Cold War, you know, and, and all this other stuff. And so the supply, the physical supply of palladium started to shrink right at a time when demand was taking off. And the banks, which were running the exact same kind of digital derivative pricing scheme in palladium that they run in silver, decided they could not afford that level of naked exposure. So over a period of about three years, they exited their COMEX position. I mean, you can go back, if you can still find this data, go back to 2016, you'll see the same commitment of trader structure and bank participation yeah. report structure in New York palladium. Yeah. As you see in silver, where the banks are all short and the specs are all long and price runs up and the banks get more short and the specs get more long, then they get washed out and, you know, and the whole process starts again. Well, what happened, it, you know, when the, when the supply started to uh, be exhausted and in short supply, the banks realized they couldn't be on the hook for this anymore. And so we started to see sharply negative lease rates in London, which means banks were desperate to borrow palladium from one another, even though they had to pay back even more palladium to pay off the lease a month later, mm -hmm. they were just living hand to mouth trying to keep the scheme going. Anyway, at the end of the day, in a three year period from about 17 to 2020, the banks completely got out of the paper shenanigans in palladium and price went from 500 to 2,500. Yeah. And even now you can look, you can look at the, the COT reports as they come out and it, it looks more like a, you know, any other commodity, corn, uh, you know, uh, crude oil, soybeans, whatever, where it's just an even mix of banks and speculators being long and short rather than, you know, one side, you know, all the way up here. And so anyway, I, that's what can happen if we can force the banks uh, out of you know, their monopolistic control of, of price in a market. And, uh, and so, yeah, uh, we just got to keep going, man. Kinesis is a great way to do it because I know every, every single ounce that, uh, that gets involved in the Kinesis monetary system takes an ounce out of the hands of these dastardly banks. And, uh, man, we just got to keep going, got to keep pedal to the metal. Absolutely. And, and it really, it, you know what you're talking about. It's we, 
We, and, and Wall Street Silver is the same thing. We all have to take responsibility for ourselves. We can't just curl yeah. up in a ball and say, well, it's just the way it was. No, there was people suddenly recognize, some smart people recognize the fact that, hold on a minute, leverage. I, and just like yeah. you're saying, with, hey. mm. there comes a point where the physical market suddenly eats up. The the yeah. right back against these guys, and to such a degree, there's no there's no offer to sell anymore. They just need. And remember, you remember so vividly. We went through this. You did a great analysis of it. We all did. March twenty. What happened was it was the breaking of the EF of the of the of the e, EP uh, the ETF the EFP Sorry, no, the e, the EFPs. The, that little thread that connects the COMEX, undeliverable COMEX contracts to 100 to 1 gold yep. contracts. Yep. What happened was it fractured. Nothing's yep. been repaired. And right. this is the beauty of why having your, your little video there, um, it, people need to understand what that 100 to 1 means. And it's like, this is massive. And yeah. I think um, I think one thing to just explain to people at the moment, because a lot of people say, well, hold on, this is look at this counterintuitive action in, in, in gold. Hold on. What about Basel three? I mean, things are happening. Well, actually, you have to remember that an unallocated contract that where, where we're talking 600 tons of, of unallocated contracts every day getting cleared, 9000 tons of the silver every day. I mean, what is it? It is, it is an over-the-counter long, which is a foreign exchange contract. So when you need to unwind these unmanageable contracts, they're going to be too expensive to trade. What do you have to do? The first thing you have to do is you have to buy back the dollar leg because right. you've gone long. Yep. You've used it to hedge these gains on the, on the COMEX, which blew up in March. Suddenly you see second tier banks disappearing. You see people not wanting to play that game anymore and liquidity evaporates. And now you've got this process where it seems counterintuitive, but the process is I have to buy back my, my, my dollar leg. But each time you do that and square up your, your position, you've squared up another unallocated contract and taken this overhead supply away. So, but it, the balance is right now the balance is yes but what about china what about russia what about other people yeah. coming in and saying thank you i'll take that in the spot market thank you and there's that balance right now which is an imbalance but the balance is while they clear these get out of these contracts there are people saying give me the real physical mm -hmm. so i think that's what's happening right now personally uh, and and I'm, i want people to be not to be psyched out by the fact that it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Sure as hell it is. And it looks yeah. bullish as hell. And silver, and, and, and like you've said, silver is really the Achilles heel. Silver is the same actors. And if you can watch what's happening in the silver market, you know damn well what these same actors are doing in the, uh, in the gold market, yep. which is harder to read, of course. Yep. No, but I agree with you, Andy. And again, we've been getting back, drawing the parallels palladium. We used to call palladium you know, the palladium bullet because it exposed all these other markets because yep. they're all structured the same way. But now we, we, uh, we're just going to have to, like I said, keep going. Uh, that, yep. that EFP breakdown is still going. I mean, they used to do 10, 20,000, sometimes 30,000 of these exchanges for physical a day. I just <laughs> added up, coincidentally, this morning. Year to date, the average isn't even 3,000. I mean, if anything's indicative of how that market is still broken, you know, and how the banks are <clears throat> are desperate to uh, get out from under some of these positions. Uh, that's a sign right there. They don't want to play anymore. And we've got these massive deliveries on COMEX now that are 30,000 contracts a month where that used to be three or four, right? So yeah. that's not going away. And so it, it's, a very <clears throat> it's a very interesting time to watch all this happen. And, you know, I, I'm thinking, too, as you were talking, that, that video that you guys made, that's, that's not applicable to just – these unallocated accounts that, that people invest in. I mean, you can use that same example for what goes on in London, what goes on in New York uh, with these exchanges. It's the same thing. Yes. And so we yes. just have to somehow force and unwind of the system. And the only way you can force that unwind is through physical delivery, getting you getting it out of the banker's hands, getting into something like Kinesis, getting into your own personal vault. 
and and just kind of stretch that leverage that the banks use to such an extent that it snaps and they and they just can't keep going those are sage words to end with <laughs> uh, with with craig and and i want to thank you again um, thank you for, for, for everything you've done for everybody. Thank you for what you've done at for returning and, and, and speaking to us. We've never got enough time. And whether I come on and with you or whether, it, whether, whether it's you coming on with us, we've never got enough time. We're going to have to do this again. But, um, but can you tell everyone um, how they can find you at TF Metals? I appreciate that, Andy. Uh, yeah, you know, it's crazy. We were young guys. When uh, when we first met, look at us now. Look what it's done to us. <laughs> Gosh, um, it's been uh, 10, 12 years now uh, that there's yeah. been a TF Metals report, and um, I like to think it's 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 different. You know, so many subscription websites. You know, they're just trying to you know scalp you know a couple of pennies in trading, and you're never you're going to be like you said. Ninety five percent of the people that walk into the casino lose. And that's what you're going to do if you're trying to trade all the time. And we pay attention to the price, right? But it's mainly because we're trying to figure out when we want to buy our physical. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe save us some money if we know that maybe the banks are going to come after us and wash price back over the next couple of days or weeks. And so the, the, the site itself is a great community. It's uh, the interaction you get from people around the world is worth the $15 a month. But then the other analysis where I'm everybody's kind of eyes and ears each day uh, aging myself like in dog years. We got to call it gold years, Andy. Uh, every year I'm watching the precious metals markets ages is about five, I think. Um, but I'm everybody's eyes and ears, and I give you a report every morning and a podcast every afternoon just to kind of keep depth to speed as to what's going on. And man, as you know, there's a lot going on, um, particularly this summer. So we're going to have to get back together once we get this um, uh, first round of Basel three stuff. See how that impacts the UK banks. Yeah. See if there is, in fact, an impact on the US banks and um, yeah. begin to assess where we're, how things are going to play out in the second half of the year. <clears throat> Can't wait, Craig. Can't wait. And so thank you for that. And uh, let's get back together. Let's set up another date. And look, it only takes, you know, it's me. I call you. You call me. Hey, let's do something. That's the way we freewheel. That's the way we roll. <laughs> and I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much. My pleasure, my friend. All the best. And there you have it. I told you, everyone, that you would be in for a treat. Uh, what a great episode. Thank you so much, Craig Hemke from TF's Metals Reports. We thank you so much for all you've done. And, and again, what a great video that explains it perfectly. And so there you have another fascinating episode of Live from the Vault. Be sure to help us spread the word about this channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. And if you click on the bell notification, you will be notified as each episode goes live. Also, in the comments, let us know who you'd most like to have interviewed regarding the physical precious metals market, and we will do our best uh, to bring these powerful interviews to you as we go, as we continue. So there you have it, episode number 40 on to 41 and with that we'll see you next time on live from the vault see you then